let's uh, start the second talk. Uh, so the title of the second talk is uh, Secret Sharing with Certified Board Edition by James and Justin. And Justin will give a talk. Thank you for the introduction. So let's imagine a scenario where you have some large pile of data and you want to store it, but you don't want to store it yourself because buying your own servers is expensive. There are a variety of uh, storage providers that you could rent their storage. Uh, but the issue is you don't know who's trustworthy and who might try and steal your data. The classical solution to this is to use secret sharing where um, you split your secret and you distribute it, your data over uh, a variety of servers. Then as long as not too many servers are trying to steal your data, uh, you get security. And the nice part about secret sharing as compared to say encryption is that it doesn't rely on any computational hardness assumptions. Uh, so we saw during the uh, earlier in the week during uh, two of the invited talks that hardness assumptions can be nice, but we they are assumptions. We don't know, um, sorry, this is auto running. Uh, we don't know um, if they're actually true or if they're broken. But the thing about secret sharing is there is one uh, assumption that is being made, and that's that the adversary doesn't corrupt too many shares. And in a world where data breaches are frequent, it's not necessarily true, or it's not clear how realistic of an assumption this is. Over long periods of time, the adversary could potentially steal um, uh, extra shares. And as soon as one extra share is stolen here, uh, we see that there are a total, if any three shares can reconstruct, um, the adversary is, we lose security completely and the adversary is able to steal our data. So the question that we set out to answer is, can we hope to achieve security against an adversary who can eventually corrupt an authorized set of shares? something that's able to natively um, reconstruct. Now in the classical setting, there's not really much hope because uh, classical shares can always be compromised or copied. So there's no way of giving out a share temporarily or anything. But in the quantum setting, Broadbent and Islam showed that quantum mechanics enables certifiable deletion of secret information. And in fact, they and some follow-up work by uh, Bartusik and Karana considered a very limited uh, notion of secret sharing of certified deletion, where there are two shares and uh, you need both to reconstruct the secret. Let me be a little bit more specific about what I mean by uh, secret sharing with certified deletion. Here, we split a classical secret into quantum shares then it's possible to perform a destructive measurement on a share to delete the information that it contains. Now, when a client wants to cancel their subscription at some company, because maybe they're worried about their information security practices, or they just don't like the most recent price hike, uh, they can ask the storage company to delete their information and verify that um, the information is actually deleted. So even if there is a data breach on this company, uh, there's no issues. In this work, we have three main contributions. The first is definitions of secret sharing with certified deletion. Uh, the second is constructions. And the third is a new tool that we use to build our constructions and do the analysis, uh, which is a high rate randomness extractor for certain quantum entropy sources. For the rest of the talk, I'm going to start by giving our definitions. We actually have two different incomparable definitions, no signaling certified deletion and adaptive certified deletion. Then I'll go over the more technically interesting of the two constructions, which is for adaptive certified deletion and give a security intuition of it. Finally, uh, I'll give a, an overview of our high rate seedless ex randomness extractors and conclude with some open problems. Uh, to figure out a good definition, 
Let's start by recalling the definition for encryption with certified deletion. Here, the adversary starts with a um, ciphertext, a quantum ciphertext, and then it deletes it by producing some valid certificate. Finally, it gets the key and tries to guess the message. And it should not be able to do this, even if it's also given unbounded computational power at this step. Let's see if we can adapt this to the secret sharing setting. Imagine that we split our secret into some number of shares. Let's say seven shares, and any five of them are authorized and can come together to reconstruct the secret. Here, the left side of the um, wall is similar to the uh, ciphertext, and the right side, which is inaccessible to the adversary, is similar to the key. The adversary deletes some of these uh, shares that it has access to uh, by producing valid certificates. And if it deletes enough, then the wall comes down and it gets access to the rest of the shares. This is a very natural um, extension of, certified of encryption with certified deletion, but it's not meaningful for all access structures. For example, what if the rest of the shares already form an authorized set? then it doesn't really matter what the adversary did with the initial shares, uh, because as soon as it gets the new shares, it already learns the secret. To deal with this, we introduce two different definitions of um, certified deletion or secret sharing, which capture slightly different adversaries. No signaling is a sort of fast but distributed adversary, whereas adaptive is a slow but more linear adversary. And I would like to mention that these two uh, definitions are incomparable. Let's start off with the definition for no signaling certified deletion. First, we start off by splitting our shares. Let's say that we have six shares and any three of them are authorized. Now, the adversary gets to partition these shares into uh, unauthorized sets. So there can be, in this case, at most two in each set. Um, and they operate on each of these sets uh, in a non, in a local manner. So there's no communication across these sets, and they must produce deletion certificates. They are allowed to share entanglement, though, across uh, sets. Then, if they've deleted enough shares that the remaining shares, for example, here there are only two, uh, the remaining shares are unauthorized, then the adversaries get to combine their views. And for security, we require that uh, the combined view should be independent of the secret. So it doesn't matter if you started off with secret zero or secret one, uh, the final combined view is independent. Our first result is that there exists secret sharing with no signaling certified deletion for any monotone access structure. Here, S is a an access structure is a set of authorized sets. And monotone just means that if you uh, contain an authorized set, uh, then you are also authorized. Now let's move on to adaptive certified deletion, the slower adversary. We start with the same split as before, except now the adversary does not get to uh, see any of the shares yet. One at a time, the adversary can do two things. It can corrupt a share of its choice, or it can delete a share by giving out the certificate. If the certificate is uh, invalid, then um, the experiment immediately aborts. It can keep doing this for as long as it likes. And the only constraint is that the set of shares which is corrupted but not yet deleted cannot be authorized. Uh, in this example, if the adversary controls two non-deleted shares, um, then if it gets a third one, it just gets the secret. So the next step that it has to do, uh, or that it's allowed to do, is to delete. And this experiment keeps going until the adversary eventually gets the opportunity to corrupt every single share. Then our requirement, similar to the previous case, is that uh, the final view of the adversary is indistinguishable uh, or is independent of the secret. So it doesn't matter if you start with 
S0 or S1. Our second result is that there exists a threshold secret sharing scheme with adaptive uh, certified deletion security. And I'd like to mention that uh, as an optimization, we can actually prepare the shares using single qubit operations. There's no entanglement needed. Um, and a threshold scheme is just the running example I've been using where you have some number of shares, let's say K, or sorry, N, and then any K of them are authorized. Now let's discuss the construction. And I'll note that our construction is specific to uh, threshold access structures, as I mentioned. Let's start by recalling uh, prior work. They considered a scheme where you start with a classical secret and you split it into a quantum share and a classical share. If the adversary gets access to the quantum share and then deletes it, uh, and then they get access to the classical share, then they cannot tell what secret you started with. I'd like to uh, mention that only the classical or only the quantum share can be deleted. The classical share is classical information. It can never be deleted. So let's think about it. Can we use uh, at this two of two sharing scheme as a black box? And actually our no sig signaling construction does do this. Um, but if we're going to try and adapt this to the adaptive setting, um, it doesn't quite work out. And the issue intuitively is that the classical share can never be deleted. So over a long period of time, as the adversary corrupts more and more shares, it eventually accumulates lots of information that it can use to subvert later deletions. And actually there is a uh, explicit attack in the adaptive setting on our no signaling construction. Let's dive into the two out of two construction slightly more and see why it needs this classical part. In their scheme, the quantum share contains some data qubits, which encode the secret, and some check positions, which are independent of the secret. You can think of the data positions as being in the computational basis and the check positions as being in the Fourier basis. Uh, if you were to know exactly where the data positions were, then you could simply measure them all in the computational basis and extract the data. Of course, this requires knowing where the data positions are. And so the classical share contains a mapping of where the data positions are and where the check positions are. Now, the issue here is that we need this mapping in order to decode the secret, but it can't ever be deleted because it's classical. So this gives us a little bit of a circularity where if we can protect this mapping theta, then we can get secret sharing with adaptive certified deletion. However, to get secret sharing with adaptive certified deletion, we kind of need to protect theta in the first place. Um, so we're stuck. And our key idea is to use an approach where we can reconstruct without knowledge of the data indices. Our approach is based on Shamir's polynomial secret sharing, uh, which turns out to have very good error correction properties. Let me describe that in a bit more detail. We're going to start off with a polynomial, f, where f of 0 equals s, our secret. Uh, and each share will contain some number, t, of uh, evaluations of f. Mixed in with these evaluations are going to be some random Fourier base elements, which are going to act as the check positions. Now, as I'm sure you are all aware, if you accidentally measure a position in the wrong basis, you completely destroy the information. And this holds for both bases. Um, OK, so if we want the adversary to delete the information, we simply ask them to measure everything in the Fourier basis. And because it doesn't know which positions are which, the best it can do is just to measure almost everything in the Fourier basis. And whatever the measurement result is gives us the certificate. So we can simply check each of the check positions and compare them to what the actual value 
uh, in the Fourier basis should be. Okay, let's talk about, that's deletion. Let's talk about reconstruction. When reconstructing, we have a large number of evaluations of F that are mixed with some check positions that are uncorrelated with F. If we were to measure everything in the computational basis, then each of these check positions gives you a random error. Now, the key insight is that if we have enough redundancy, enough evaluations of the polynomial in K shares, uh, then we can actually correct each of these errors. And so we actually show that it's possible to tune the degree of the polynomial, the number of evaluations in each share, and the number of check positions so that K minus one shares, which are unauthorized, uh, doesn't reveal the polynomial. But if you have an authorized set of shares, at least K of them, then you can actually correct all of the errors in them. Now let's talk about the security intuition. So first, let's do a slight change of perspective. We're going to lazily construct the shares instead of constructing everything at the beginning of the experiment. So first, because the first D points, which consists of a little bit over two shares worth of information here, if we're looking at any three shares are authorized, uh, because these uh, these first two shares and a little bit of the third one don't yet determine the polynomial, uh, we can simply sample them uniformly at random. And then when the adversary asks to corrupt them, uh, we copy everything over. Then the third share, act, uh, before it corrupts a third share, the adversary has to delete a share. Uh, now the third share to be corrupted has some redundancy with the polynomial. Um, and so we have to use polynomial interpolation to find it. We can just do that using the copies of the prior shares in the challenger's register. And we can keep doing this to find the rest of the shares for the rest of the experiment. Now with this change of perspective, I'd like to go back and argue that the next share looks random. This is clearly true for the first two and a little bit shares because these shares are actually truly random. Um, next, we can actually show that when the adversary deletes a share, which it has to do before it receives the third share, um, the challenger's copy, the actual share, becomes high entropy in the adversary's view. Then we show that polynomial interpolation acts as a good uh, randomness extractor for this source of randomness. Speaking of randomness extractors, let's talk about um, our final contribution, which is a high rate unseated randomness extractor. So here we have some quantum entropy source, which we run through the extractor and hopefully uh, get some truly random output. And the input size and the output size can be different. Let's imagine first that if the source were a Fourier basis element, then we could just measure it in the computational basis and get true randomness. Easy. Unfortunately, that's not always the case. Uh, what happens if it's almost a Fourier basis state? And I don't mean in a geometrical sense. I mean specifically that this is a superposition of Fourier basis elements that are kind of close to just one of them. So you can imagine that the later half of the state is actually a Fourier basis element. And maybe the first few qubits are in the computational basis. Uh, in this case, it's not really clear that you get something truly random when you do a computational basis measurement. Uh, and additionally, the adversary might even have some side information about what these offsets are. So for example, it might know which positions are in the computational basis and which positions are in the Hadamard basis. The way our extractor works is it simply measures everything in the computational basis and then applies a matrix R to the measurement result. And this gives you your output. 
we show that if every m column, little m columns of R are linearly independent, are linearly, yeah, independent, then Rx is truly random, even given the side information register. Uh, an alternative view of this is that R should be a parity check matrix for a linear error correcting code with distance little m. Uh, finally, I'd like to end with a few open questions. First, can we get adaptive certified deletion for general access structures? We only constructed this for uh, threshold access structures. Next, what about a stronger definition and construction that captures both distributed and adaptive attacks? There's also the question of public verification. It's been pointed out to us a few times that our no signaling construction actually can be generalized to have um, public verification since it's simply a black box compiler and it preserves public verification. Uh, but these techniques don't seem compatible with our adaptive construction. Another very interesting question is what about other threshold primitives such as threshold signatures where you're given, you give out a variety of um, shares of a signing key and together those shares can all come together to sign some message non-interactively. Uh, can we enable a scenario where you give out your shares of the signing key and then when somebody is kicked off the board of trustees, uh, you ask them to return their signing key and they can no longer help sign things. Finally, there's also the question of uh, high rate commitments with certified deletion. With our um, new high rate randomness extractor, uh, it's very natural to wonder if you can just immediately uh, or somehow use it to construct high rate commitments or maybe high rate FHE, these other um, interesting primitives that need computational security uh, with certified deletion. Um, unfortunately, there's a little bit some technical issues in just immediately adapting the construction uh, and the analysis. So our high rate uh, extractor is not quite enough. Thanks for listening. So we also have plenty of time for questions. Sorry if I missed this during your talk, but so for the no signaling security definition that you use, there's no notion of an extractor like part of the proof that you need for it to work. Is that correct? No, it's all black box in uh, prior works. Oh, okay. And for this new extractor result that you constructed, it seems a little bit tailored to this adaptive setup and you construct it in a seedless fashion. Is it critical that it's seedless or can you patch things over with a seeded extractor somehow? Yeah, it actually is very important that it's seedless. Uh, and this comes up in several other works uh, mm -hmm. in certified deletion. The issue is if the adversary can figure out or has some maybe even computationally hidden information about the seed, um, then it can influence the extract or the randomness source when it's doing deletion uh, and then security immediately breaks. So if we could hide the seed, then this is fine, but hiding the seed gets us back to this circularity where in order to hide the seed, we need adaptive uh, security already. And I guess in some sense, a similar sort of problem might show up in the commitment setting. Yeah, exactly. Um, so prior work by uh, Bartusik and Karana did use a seedless extractor there, but their seedless extractor uh, is based on XOR and actually uses a very large source of entropy, say lambda bits, and then compresses it down to just a single bit of randomness. Ah, oh, okay. That's Whereas right. here, we actually need um, to take almost a, or a full share of randomness and then produce 
almost a full share uh, of randomness. Hmm. I see. And so from this perspective, also an entropic uncertainty relation argument like in the original broadband Islam is not very relevant here, I suppose. Yeah, for them, that was fine because, uh, again, you can hide the seed uh, and it only becomes revealed later. But um, again, you need to uh, be able to hide the seed uh, information theoretically for that. Okay, work. thank you. We still have time, so good. Uh, so I think there is some work that studied unclonable secret sharing, and could you give some brief comparison with that? Yeah, so um, if I recall correctly, the unclonable secret sharing work uh, actually ran into a lot of hurdles, and one of their main results is that uh, you can't, you simply can't do it in some settings. Um, Whereas in the uh, certified deletion case, we actually are able to do it with no assumptions, no additional settings beyond the plane model. Um, yeah, I forget the details of their uh, construction and their definition then. So can you compare the definition like so one de imply the other or are they incomparable? Um, I don't recall right now. Um, I think the definitions were incomparable, but I'd have to look at it again and get back to you. Okay, thanks. Okay, so are there more questions? Okay, if not, we listen, Justin, again. <laughs> 